Thank you so much. Thanks, Michael, for the opportunity to, to, to speak to you all. And uh, so I, I thought I would try to make this extremely practical. You know, what, what should you think about in terms of your research careers? And, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> what, what, what should you think about in terms of your research careers? And um, so these are some of my funding sources. And I just point out that we do have this relationship with Massimo. Um, so I'm going to do this as a series of questions. I'm going to do a series of questions, and then I'm going to do a case study, and then to basically apply the, question, the answers to the questions. So I think in beginning, what you should do is I think you should, you know, like chill out and, and ask yourself, what are the big questions in anesthesia, right? And, and I just put these up there. I'm not saying these are the big questions. I just put down some examples of some things that we talk about, like uh, post-operative cognitive function. Everybody you know, talks about that now. It's a big issue. Is there something I can do? Do I have some specific insights that may be useful for solving that problem? ARAS, you know, I, you know, I'm in the hospital every Tuesday. I came to the hospital one Tuesday, and I found out, oh, we're doing ARAS now. I, OK, well, so, OK, I guess I better learn about ARAS, all right? You know, so obviously important. And then I found out there's a whole big structure. It's not going to be in, only in our hospital, but it's going to be in every hospital in like our whole partner's network. OK, I guess I missed something, all right? <laughs> Neurotoxicity of anesthetics, you know, we, we hear about it a lot. And, and like today, this morning, we heard Jeff Balzer talk about, you know, big data, you know, anesthesiology. Are these, you know, again, so I think, to me, this is like the really, really fun part where you sit back and you say, hmm, what are some of the, what are some of the big issues? And it, here's, here's the part which I think goes with this. I would say, question the obvious things we do, right? We do everything the same way, right? Induction is always done with a hypnotic. It wasn't always done with a hypnotic. We used to breathe people down all the time, right? But so, you know, maybe there's something there. And actually, just think about one thing. I'll just plant one idea with you, right? You could anesthetize someone completely if you're not using muscle relaxants, have them breathing on their own with just an inhale drug. So you don't have to stop. You don't have to have, you do not have to have apnea when you have anesthesia, right? So, so I mean, these are things that we don't even think about anymore. But again, if you start just questioning, I mean, you measure muscle relaxation by train of four. You know, I had the good fortune to work with Hassan Ali, you know, who, who came up with this idea. It was like phenomenal to be able to do that. But does it have to be done that way? Oh, the cables in the OR? Come on, right. <laughs> in the day of the iPhone, we have cables in the OR like that? Totally ridiculous, right? Totally, totally. I mean, so I'm just saying, these things are sitting right in front of us. We don't question, we just, okay, I know how to organize my cables. Look, I use ties and stuff, and you know, we, we developed this thing called a NAT rack, so you could arrange all the, all the IV bags and everything, and, and like for the cardiac cases or the big thoracic cases, and it still takes the better part of 20 minutes to get everything all set. I mean, so again, and then again, we all, you know, muscle relaxation is always provided by anticholinergic drugs, all right? So then, again, staying on a high level, can you, this is a bit of a personal thing, you know, picking a topic which I think is relevant to anesthesiology. For a number of years, we've been very, very good at picking topics outside of anesthesiology. And it's because they're there, they're bigger than us, right? And then, you know, we'll take topics and say, well, let me, well, stem cells are there, let me just give them some anesthesia and see what happens, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean be, be, because you can, right? I mean, but, but you know, that's maybe, you know, but I mean, let's ask a question that's going to make anesthesiology better as opposed to asking a question of something we can do. And, and, I, and I think that we, we really, I just feel we don't do this enough. And then realizing, again, so the, the fourth topic is new technologies, like what's happening? Again, there's so much being talked about about machine learning. Optogenetics is like one of the biggest things. I could have put CRISPR up here, for example. You know, educating ourselves about some of the new ideas. But again, my bias is, all right, how can I use these new ideas to help me answer a very salient question in the field of anesthesiology? You know, organ on a chip, all these, you know, you know new imaging ideas, all right? And then, you know, something which has been like a theme here, you know, with these sessions, like, who are the correct mentors? 
And I think here you really have to think broadly. And this is like a fact-finding mission. It's like asking questions. And I've been learning a little bit about this now as I've gotten involved in some commercial endeavors. And, you know, it's something I don't know that much about. But everybody I come in contact with, if there's any hint that they have some idea about how to, how to run a startup or how to manage a business, you know, I talk to them. I get information. And I think that's what you really have to do. You really have to do your due diligence. Your department, your hospital, university, your town, elsewhere. I mean, I, I, I literally, you know, get letters from like all over, people asking me questions. Would you be willing to advise me on A? Or do you think B would work? Or, and so I think given how connected we are in the world, you shouldn't feel like your mentors or your collaborators necessarily have to be those people who sit like in your department. I think that's one of the things that really, really limits us. And I can run the same list for collaborators as well. And it's probably even more important in terms of collaborators. Because everything you need will not be right in your department. It won't be right in your hospital. It won't be right, you know, in your, it won't be right in your university. And, and here's the part where, which is both fun and also maybe a little bit unnerving, right? You may have to get some additional training. And because probably if you're thinking, if you're really thinking out of the box, you really find a cool question, you're going to have to, you know, learn something new. But that's all part of becoming, you know, a, um, a researcher who's working on the cutting edge because of everything you're, you know, if you're going to, you know, like determine whether one muscle relaxant is faster than the other, you're going to use standard train of form monitoring. Uh, there's not too much more to learn, right? I mean, that, you know, we, that, that was done, you know, 20, 30 plus years ago. But these are some of the things which come up. Laboratory techniques, being formally trained in clinical research, you know, statistics, it's always an Achilles heel for most of us, and also imaging. You know, these are just some, some of the ideas of some of the topics. And then the final thing here, so the final thing is thinking about uh, how you're going to fund this, right? It's great to have the ideas. And, and, and here's where, you know, I put a little bit more of the responsibility, not so much on you all, but, you know, and those of us who are sort of in my cohort are certainly people who run departments or, I, I just think we have to be willing to generate internal funds because I don't know of any sort of, you know, cool new project that started because the person just showed up and had all the resources. Somebody has to give you some time out of the OR, they have to give you some funds to basically get going. There's no two ways about that. So, I was at Berkeley um, on Wednesday, and I was talking with one of my colleagues there, Jose Carmina. And uh, one of the things that they just set up at Berkeley, this is, in, this is for the university, it's not in anesthesiology, I'm just drawing an analogy, is they set up these fellowships called Baker Fellowships at Berkeley. And the idea behind a Baker Fellowship is to really encourage uh, faculty members there to have the money that they need to bridge the gap between having an idea and then trying to start new with it and take it out to commercialize it or this sort of thing, right? So these, and so in a lot of places, like we've done this too, like in my institute that I'm part of at MIT, we have these startup fellowships. They can range from $50,000 to $200,000, $250,000, but the idea is to have some funds so you can get going. And, I th and again, this, this part of it really isn't so much for you all, but for you know, those of us who are running departments, I think we have to make these sorts of resources that, you know, available so that ideas can get off the ground, because without it, they just won't start. And then thinking about you know, foundations, you know, the, the, um, you know, Allison is going to tell us in detail about NI, you know, NIH, but then these other sources, and then as things start to look sort of a bit more commercial, you know, venture capital, these are very, very real sources of of funding. There's certain, there's certain criteria that you have to meet in order to have conversations with these individuals, but nevertheless, it's, if you don't think about it, you won't look for it. Let me just put it that way, all right? So now for the case study. So here's my case study, Ken Song. <laughs> all right? So, 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 so Ken did this a few years ago. And I got his, he didn't just leave because I was going to do this. He, he, had to, he actually had to go moderate a session, you know, but he, he planned to be here. But I asked him if I could use him as a case study. All right, he said it was all right. All right. So, so I mean, Ken is like, you know, phenomenal with a capital fee. I mean, I, 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 think, he's, I think he's outstanding. And so, um, again, 
question the obvious things we do. So we always let people come too from anesthesia, right? So why not wake them up, right? So, and I remember, you know, when Ken and I first started talking about this, and we would tell some people about this, go, oh, you wake them up, you might make them more delirious and stuff. Or why would you want to do that? I remember one guy telling us that, you know, the drugs work fine already. Why are you so concerned about that? All right, so that's one of the things you're going to find out. You come up with a new idea. As you've heard, everybody's going to tell you why it doesn't work. Okay, you can't listen to yourself. This is your inner voice. You know, you have to listen to that. You've thought about this. They haven't. But it's like, okay. And the more people are saying, <laughs> it's actually even better than that, you know. The more people are saying, like, uh, you know, that's going against the grain, I go. And they go, that won't work, I go. <laughs> Fantastic, right? I'm glad, I'm glad you see it that way. All right, so, 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 so what, did, what did Ken do? So he asked the, he, 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 he after looking at this in, in a lot of detail, and, and actually parenthetically, I was just talking with Angela a second ago, we were talking about delayed emergence. So we were in the operating room, and we had a delayed emergence, and uh, so we thought, oh, delayed emergence, you know, let's get some drug and see if we can try to wake the patient up. So we got caffeine. Sorry, Giancarlo, but it doesn't work for waking you up from anesthesia, right? It, it, it might help with, uh, with, with sleep deprivation, but it doesn't wake you up from anesthesia. And we pulled off the class, we tried the physostigmine. It didn't work. You know, the guy was still there. And if you've ever tried this, the, the, the systemic side effects of, are, are, are very profound. Let me just put it that way. All right. And, and you, you do not make friends with the nursing staff when you, when you do that, all right? So it, 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 just, it just didn't work. And this is what's in the books. You read this. This is what you're supposed to do. So scratching his head, doing some research, he came up with some other ideas. And one of his ideas was to try Ritalin. So methylphenidate, you know, could you, you know, wake people up with that. So this is the ideas that he came up with, you know, setting up a rodent model for this, coming up with a way of thinking about it, being specific. And then, you know, not just, and then this is like, as we talked about this, you know, we agreed, like, who cares if you can wake up a rat? It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't count. So really think about pushing it so you can actually do it in humans. And so he was, he was totally down for it, right? So, but then, What's the additional training? What are the technologies? What are the mentor? Who are the mentors and who are the collaborators? So again, this is where we just happen to have a fortunate set of circumstances. There are a lot of resources which are in a very short span at location. So optogenetics, so Ed Boyden just happens to be one of the inventors of optogenetics. He just happens to be at MIT, happens to be in the same institute where I am. And then my longstanding colleague, um, Matt Wilson, who's an expert neurophysiologist, who you know, helped him with his training, in particular Krista Van Dort, who was a colleague of Giancarlo's out at uh, Michigan who joined our group. So we had um, you know, neurophys expertise. And then, so for the behavioral studies, Ken actually went out to San Diego, spent a month and a half out there with Pam Reinigel because she had these new, um, she had these new behavioral techniques. Because what we wanted to do, um, he, he actually, you know, he said, I want to do something different from just um, having the rat turn over, you know? you know? So he turns over, so what? Who cares, right? I want, I want to have a behavioral paradigm where it actually shows that he's actually functioning cognitively because that's the sort of thing that's going to map into things that people are going to agree, yes, this may work in humans because now the person, I can see that his brain is working, all right? And then at the same time, though, so he goes and spends six months in, California, trains and learns that. Then when he comes back, you know, we've said, well, you know, you want to be able to do the clinical study too. So he takes the clinical studies program at Harvard, you know. So now, one of the things you have to realize is this is where, again, the departments really, really matter. You can't do this unless your department chair is helping you out. This will not happen, right? And so again, we can have all these planning sessions we want, but if our academic leaders are not supporting us, none of this will occur. And obviously he got tremendous support from initially from Warren Zapol and then from Janine, who was like one of his one of his biggest fans. And then the other thing which I'll put down there is it's never too late, it's never too early to think about intellectual property. Because 
The bottom line is, if you're coming up with new ideas and you don't have some way to get them out there to patients, right? And intellectual property is one of the most compelling ways to do that. It's just going to be a great idea. It's going to die in the valley of death. So it's never too early to, to think about that. All right. So what do you do for the initial funding? It came from the department. We were very lucky. The department was quite generous. You know, Janine gave him the time, gave him, you know, the funds to basically get going because this was an idea and, you know, Ken was changing, you know, changing his path. And you've probably seen this video before, but I just, I just have to show it because I think it's so cool. Because, you know, so this is, this may not work because I didn't check it before. Oh, it's good. All right, so there's one of his rat volunteers, right? So, so, so he, he's anesthetized and he's going to get, he's going to get Ivy Ritalin here into his tail vein, all right? And I just want to, so, so this was some, Ken set this whole thing up, you know, this wasn't what he was working on before. And, you know, the, the rat's going to come too as soon as he gives him the riddle and flushes it in, right? He was anesthetized there with, with isoflurane, all right? And, you know, and so this is using like the kind of the standard paradigm, just, you know, behaviorally seeing if the, there's a change. Remember, the isoflurane is still going on, and eventually, you know, the rat's going to turn over, right? It, it'll, it takes him a second or two because his feet are caught in the wires, but he's going to turn over. So this is just, you know, trying the idea out. Right, and so this suggests that you know it may be, you know it may be quite plausible. All right, keep keep. He does make it. Come on, come on, guys. All right, so, 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 right. All right. Come on, dude. All right. All right. So, okay, he made it. All right. All right. So so all right. So so that th th I'm showing you this because this is the standard paradigm. You know, writing reflex, behavior response. I mean, come on, that's a reflex, right? It's called the writing reflex, right? It's not the writing cognitive reflex, right? So, and, and so what has he really shown? So you, we, we saw him come too, but this is just to show you what kind of study Ken designed when he combined this idea of really developing something which is precisely going to activate some brain circuits and then having a behavioral paradigm that really showed you that the animal was in a state where it was functional again. So what he did next was he trained the rats to execute a behavioral task. So what the rat does is he goes here and he pokes the right thing on the wall and he turns around and he'll get a food reward. All right? So then he does that again. All right? And so, so he anesthetizes the animal and when the animal wakes up he's supposed to go back to work. Now the way he wakes him up though is he's going to stimulate his ventral tegmental area. So this is the area that's producing, you know, dopamine. It's sort of this pathway that, let's say, the Ritalin is working on, all right? So he's going to do that. And then his animal's going to work for a while. He's not going to turn the anesthesia off. When he turns the stimulation off, the animal's going to go out again, all right? So I'm just going to show this. So here is, I think this. So this is the animal anesthetized there. There's no stimulation. Let's say sedated, right, to be fair, because he's, he's not, it's not like um, he's profoundly anesthetized. So what Ken is going to do, he's going to turn the stimulation on, not turn the acid off. And so here he comes in, he stimulates at 40 hertz, and the animal gets up. So he looks, he looks for the food first. See, there's no free lunch, right? So now he turns around. He hits the right light there. Remember, the anesthesia is still on. Turns around, right? Now he turns around again. Hits the correct light. A little wobbly, but he's functioning. So this seems like he's, he's not just turning over, but he's cognitively active in some sense, right? But now he, hits, he gets the wrong one, he, right? So that tells me he got it wrong, right? And so now, remember the anesthesia is still on. What Ken is going to do, he's going to turn the, he's going to turn the stimulation off, right? And now the animal's out again. All right. So, so he he's he's manipulating these circuits, and and but he's showing you a behavioral a behavioral task which is more credible in terms of whether or not giving stimulation or activating these circuits would suggest that you could perhaps function after after anesthesia. And then just quickly, the anatomy that he's taking advantage of is this anatomy here. So when you give dopamine, it blocks the reuptake of 
so when you give, I'm sorry, when you give Ritalin, it blocks the reuptake of dopamine. It has a few other effects too, but let's just say that's what it is for this, for this uh, discussion. And so it's in this ventral tegmental, this mesocortical pathway coming from the midbrain there out to the midbrain here, going out past the limbic system up to the cortex. And then here, and the work that, that Ken has done, he was stimulating optogenetically, and then Norm did the studies in which he also, uh, uh, he was stimulating electrically, and then Norm Taylor did studies where he actually activated this pathway optogenetically, demonstrating that you could do this, that it's, it is dopamine. So he's getting clean science, he's got something which can seemingly work clinically. So a very solid basis. So I was at, uh, I was at Vertex Pharmaceuticals a few weeks ago, I was talking with uh, their chief scientific officer, and he said the one thing which they're really trying to do there is making sure there's a very direct link between human biology, or what we used to call physiology, and whatever it is they're doing from an experimental standpoint. They just don't want to have targets just for targets sake, right? And I think that this is what's happening here. I think the reason this has potential is that the link between the human biology and the circuits is, is fairly clear. And then, or robust, I should say. And then, you know, Ken has been very successful over the last several years, you know, getting this work out there, experimental work, and he's in the midst right now of finishing up his clinical trial. So he's done a phase one trial, and literally just two days ago, he finished the phase two randomized trial. So he should be reporting on that, hopefully sometime this summer. And the idea is he's tested this out, you know, in humans. So what's happened subsequently? So he's gone on to get additional funding as part of a couple of large projects, McDonald Foundation Award, and this is again one of these awards where people are willing to take a risk on somebody young to try out a cool new idea. He set up a research team. I've just listed a few of the folks here who've helped him out. You know, a research assistant and Norm has been like a real stalwart on, particularly on the latter experiments, the opigenetic experiments, along with Krista, you know, Krista Van Dort. But the whole idea is that now this turns into something which is a really, really um, sort of solid, I think, fundable idea. But he also automatically starts becoming a mentor himself because he has to help these people along. And so it, it's just, the, it's the, you're part of a continuum, I guess, is, is the, the comment I would make. And again, I'll just leave you with one sort of uh, final idea here. It, it's never too late to think about the intellectual property. I think that if there was one thing that, you know, I, you know, I've learned, I think, you know, Ken has learned throughout this, is that there, there's, there's a big hurdle to get something out there to patients that really changes practice. It's one thing to do science and then to come through with an idea which seems plausible you can write papers about. But if you want to find something that's going to change practice, it has to get out to patients, which means you will have to be involved in some way with companies in one place or the other. And, you know, you'll feel much better about it if your ideas are protected intellectually so that, you, you know, you really continue to have the incentive to want to contribute and make those ideas be useful for patients. All right. So I'll stop there. Thanks. <laughs>